political people that are the traditional custodians of this land. I would also like to pay my respects to elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to uh, other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. Um, I'm Nancy Briggs, and I am one of the consultants at Stat Central. And um, today we're going to be um, uh, listening to a talk by Gordana Popovich, and she's going to be talking to us about um, key hacking and harking and other um, um, things that perhaps you should avoid um, when you are doing your statistical analyses. Um, if uh, this is the first time that you're attending our seminars, welcome. We do these uh, monthly uh, on Thursdays and um, we tend to um, present on basic statistical and research design issues that are of interest to researchers um, across the university at, um, at a very basic level. Um, occasionally we'll have something that um, um, can get into a bit more technical things, but most of the, the things are, are pretty accessible to a, a general research audience. Uh, we also provide um, statistical consulting services for HDR students and uh, research faculty at the university. Um, and so if you are an HDR student or you would like some general advice for your research project, you can come to us and, and um, get an appointment with one of the consultants and get some um, ideas and, and helpful advice for your project. Um, uh, so uh, I'd like to, to welcome Gordana and say, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Nancy. Can you see my slides? Okay. Yes. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, some uh, poor research practices that are pretty common. And uh, I'll tell you all about the consequences of these and um, how you can avoid them. Uh, it's important to emphasize um, that the vast majority of the time researchers uh, engage in these practices unknowingly. So they don't, they don't know that they're doing the wrong thing and what consequences um, those have. So um, I'll talk for a little while and maybe you'll have some questions. So feel free to um, pop them in the chat. And if they're sort of uh, urgent, I'm sure Nancy will uh, read them out to me. Otherwise I will um, answer them at the end. Okay, so, um, so we've got a researcher called Ivan and he's interested in um, how much dogs salivate when they are given food. So he's, he's conducting some experiments to investigate this. And while he's conducting these experiments, he makes an observation. He notices that uh, even before the dogs see the food, when they hear the footsteps of his assistant, the dogs start to salivate. So that's, that's um, Ivan's observation. Um, so what happens next? Well, Ivan thinks about this for a little while and he thinks, well, maybe this is a kind of a general thing that might happen um, more commonly. So he hypothesizes that maybe animals like dogs could be taught to associate it, uh, unrelated stimuli like footsteps or a bell with food. And, and they might react as if the food was present, even if it was not. So he has a hypothesis. Um, and then after that, he designs an experiment to, um, to test his hypothesis. So we've gone through three stages already. He's observed something in the environment. He's uh, created a hypothesis. Now he, he creates an experiment. So what he's going to do um, is pretty simple, really. Uh, he, he will ring a bell um, when some dogs, uh, uh, you know, in front of some dogs and see if they salivate. And then he will separately uh, give them food and, and see if they salivate when, when they see the food. And then um, during this sort of straining, training stage, um, and he'll record the data when he does that. And during the training stage, he will do both at the same time. So he's going to show them the food, but also ring the bell at the same time. Um, and then uh, he will uh, later on see if by just ringing the bell, he could get the dogs to salivate. So that's his experiment. Um, he records data at all these points. Um, and then uh, he, he analyzes his data. Um, he, this is in 1909. Um, and uh, most of you have guessed, I think, who Ivan might be. Um, but he, he actually doesn't do, use statistics. Um, statistics is not commonly used, statistical hypothesis testing in this time. So what he does is he writes down his data. So you can see uh, this is the bell, the tone. And when the bell is rung, you can see that the saliva uh, levels are high. And when he does a bunch of other things that he sort of uh, uses as controls, 
the, the salivation isn't very high and he just pops the data in his paper and other people can have a look at it and see that um, he's, uh, he's found some sort of a pattern. Excellent. And so then at this point, he can make a conclusion. Um, he's uh, concluded that the dogs can be taught to associate bells with food and then salivate as a result of bells when the food is not present. Uh, he reports his results to much acclaim. Uh, they are subsequently replicated and extended and um, it begins a theory called classical conditioning, which many of you uh, will be familiar with and perhaps you know the surname of, um, of um, Ivan, if you want to put it in the chat to get it off your, um, off your chest, feel free to do that. If you don't know, ask me at the end. Okay, so um, what has Ivan done? Ivan has followed the scientific um, process. He's, he's got an observation. Um, he's used that observation to form a hypothesis. Then he collected some data to test his hypothesis, analyzed the data and came up with a conclusion based on that data. So good for Ivan. So um, it wasn't useful to Ivan, but um, hypothesis testing, statistical hypothesis testing was invented in this kind of context. Uh, it was developed sort of in the 1920s. There was things that were similar to hypothesis testing um, in before the 1920s, but the sort of things that we're used to with p-values and that kind of thing is kind of more, more in the 1920s that that started. And so um, it was developed for the data analysis step in yellow of the scientific process. It does a pretty good job of this. Uh, and the primary thing that hypothesis testing does is it, it controls the probability of false positive results. So we don't wanna say there is an effect of training somebody, training a dog to um, associate the, um, the bell with the food and therefore salivate. We, we don't wanna say that's true if it's not true. We don't want a false positive. And hypothesis testing does a good job um, in the context of the scientific method of controlling for false positives. Um, and so if you use hypothesis testing in the data analysis step of the, of the scientific process, and you do find you have a small p-value, there's a, only a small chance of a false positive. So you can be quite confident that you, you've found a, a true positive. So it's, it's when you find a positive, because we know the chances of small positives are relatively small, we, we have evidence that, that the effect that you found is a true effect. So that's very nice. And that's, that's kind of how hypothesis testing came into this. Um, however, later and more like towards the time when um, people, um, scientists could do their own hypothesis tests um, using you know, software and whatnot, um, rather than having to uh, write um, on paper and do equations and sums and things. Um, it was noticed that hypothesis testing can also be very useful for the first step of the scientific process, so for, to generate hypotheses. So it wasn't designed for this, but it can be very useful. So how does that work? Well, if you want to generate some hypotheses using hypothesis testing, but to generate hypotheses, what you might do uh, is you might test lots of relationships in some data. So is this is A correlated with B, is C correlated with D? Uh, is there an effect of X on Y? Test a bunch of things and then see what's significant. And then those things that are significant are now your observations. Like Ivan noticed the salivation and the footsteps, you have noticed a, a, a correlation in your data. So those are now your observations. So now you're in the first little bit of the scientific process, observation and hypothesis. After that, what you need to do then is, of course, plan an experiment, uh, conduct the experiment, then do data analysis with yet another hypothesis test, maybe if you want, um, and then draw some conclusions to report and to, to, to tell everybody about. So that, that is how hypothesis generation can work. And this is a really powerful thing because, um, you know, you can, you can look at data, you can do lots of um, tests on data very easily, and that might find some patterns that you weren't aware of. And then that generates some interesting hypotheses, which you can then test using experiments. And that's a really good way to do that. Okay, so um, 
so that's that's really good. However, it has led to some confusion about how hypothesis testing works and what, what it can and can't do. So one of the co most common con uh, confusions is, is this idea of harking. So instead of using this hypothesis generating idea, what you do is you test many relationships in the data and then you just say, well, the ones that are significant are my conclusions, publish and we're done. And you know you, you report the significant ones in your tests in your in your paper, and um, as if they were the ones as if there were observations that you then turned into hypotheses, um, as if you had gone through the whole process. So this is harking. Harking means hypothesizing after the results are known, because you, you have a result by by checking all these things, and then you generate a hypothesis based on the results that is already known in that data. So you skip a bunch of steps in harking, and um, that's where everything kind of goes wrong. Um, so another way to do harking, so you don't necessarily need to use uh, statistical testing um, to do harking. Plotting is also um, a way to do harking. So instead of um, doing a bunch of tests on every possible combination, what you do is you plot a bunch of your data against one another, or you maybe cross tabulate depending on what you want to do. And then you look at that data and you, you look, you find some of them look like they have a relationship and you're like, well, this is the promising one. I will now test that hypothesis and then report that as if I had generated that hypothesis independently. So I will not use that, um, I won't use that to generate a hypothesis and then collect more data to test my hypothesis. I'm just gonna look at the plot, go, well, there's a, that's a relationship that's interesting. And then I'll use the hypothesis test to confirm whether or not that's significant. And then I'll report it. This is very, very commonly done. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is harking and uh, it's, it's, it's pretty much, um, um, the most common way I think of, of harking because it feels like a good, uh, a sound process. It feels like, um, because we, we're always getting encouraged to plot our data and so forth. So you're plotting your data, you're investigating your data and then you're like, okay, well, that looks like an interesting relationship. I'm gonna test that relationship. And then um, you, you find that it's significant and then you report, well, that this relationship's significant. Um, unfortunately, um, it doesn't work that way. Uh, so because hypothesis testing wasn't, wasn't um, created in this context, um, this actually doesn't work as a, a to stop false positives. So um, here's some data. So all I've done is I've got a bunch of variables, actually five. I very uninterestingly called them A to E. And um, I've plotted each one against the other. So I've got a data set with five columns and they're all continuous. And I've plotted each one of them against the other just to explore my data to see what's, what's going on. So, um, if, so for example, the plot um, that shows the relationship between B and C is this one. So B and C is this plot and A and D is this plot. So I want you to look at these plots and tell me which one is the most promising looking one, the one that looks like there's a relationship between the variables the most. And I want you to just type that in the chat. So if maybe it will be A and B, so you just type A, B in the chat. Okay, so a lot of people said D and E. I totally agree. I think D and E, it's the, it's the slope is the most um, steep. And, um, and so that's the, um, that's the one that looks the most promising, like there is a, um, a relationship there. And if I, if I do a correlation test on all of these, uh, I'll find that you're right. So this one has got a little star. It's the one that has a significant correlation. 
So what we've done there is humans are actually, we are doing a hypothesis test. So we are looking at this data and like st statistics is not the only place that a hypothesis test can happen. It can happen in your brain. So we are looking at all of these data and we're conducting a whole bunch of tests. So there are 10 possible sort of best um, hypotheses in here. And I've chosen this one because it's the most promising because it has the most, um, the most, the steepest gradient. And that has turned out to be significant. And that's what it's always like. The one that looks the most significant will for the most part be the most significant. And so um, you're going to hone in on the one that where the data is going to give you a significant result. So you're really in your brain doing a hypothesis test for each one of these, and then um, picking the one that's most likely to be significant to do a hypothesis test on. Now, uh, this data was generated with absolutely no um, relationships between anything. And um, this is related to like a multiple testing issue, but if you do so this is 10 hypothesis tests. It's there's a greater than 50% chance that one of them will be significant. I think it's a greater than 30% chance actually that one of them will be significant by chance. And you will very likely pick that one that is significant by chance when you plot the data. And so while there does seem to be a relationship here in, um, in the data, there isn't a relationship in the population. I know that because I generated the data from a population that has no relationship at all in the population. So this is a, a, um, a false positive. So we have done a bunch of hypothesis tests in our heads and picked the one that's the most significant. And if there is nothing going on, that one will be the one that we conduct the test on and we'll just report that D and E are highly correlated, um, but they aren't. And we've um, done a poll, we have a false positive. And so this is how harking is usually done. You, you have a little plot, you have a little look at your data and you're like, that's a, a good one. And, um, and then you just do a test on that one. So, um, so that's, that's harking. And then um, p-hacking is kind of, is completely related, but in p-hacking, you just keep testing. So you keep doing tests, uh, you know, you might have lots of variables, so you just do one variable against the other, or you might uh, delete some outliers um, or, or take subsets of the data or try different tests and you just keep going until you find a significant result. And because of the way that hypothesis testing works, you will always eventually find a significant result. That's like, you know, as long as you keep going, you will, you will find a significant result. Um, and that's very likely to be a false positive. And so um, that's basically p-hacking. You just keep going until you find something significant. And then you skip all these steps, of course, um, of doing the rest of the uh, experimental design and you just report this significant result that you found. Okay. What about other statistical sins? Um, okay, so there's a bunch that are like fishing expeditions and data mining and data dredging. These are just basically a, ex, more extreme versions of p-hacking and harking where you kind of use a computer to try to test every possible thing in a sort of algorithmic way. Um, but they, are, they have the same consequences. Um, you also, um, we did a recent seminar on multiple testing. So when you conduct multiple tests, even if you had the hypothesis before you collected the data, um, if you have multiple hypotheses, you end up with um, high false positive rates. So um, you should, if you have multiple hypotheses, you should control for multiple testing. Um, another statistical sin is also cherry picking. Um, this is um, basically you only report results that align with what you hypothesized. So if you find something that doesn't align, you just don't report it. Um, and then a, a different one is um, not publishing or reporting your null results that you did hypothesize. So say, you can, say um, Pavlov, um, oh, I've given it away. Um, say Ivan, um, you know, he had this hypothesis. Uh, and a few others, and you know, he had maybe three hypotheses, and two of them came up, you know, that they were supported, and one of them wasn't. He would need to report all of those three hypotheses, and that the one that wasn't supported wasn't supported. Otherwise, it, it looks like um, the other ones have more um, evidence than they do. Um, 
So those are uh, a bunch of other statistical sins that you might, um, that you should avoid. Okay, so what are the consequences? So um, I've kind of maybe gone a little bit backwards, but basically a significant result in a hypothesis test, it means that there's a pattern in the sample that you've collected. It doesn't mean there's pattern in the data necessarily. So, the, the, sorry, in the population or in real life. So if you imagine a population where there is no effect in the population, then in that population, every significant result is a false positive. So in that population where there's nothing going on, absolutely no, no, um, no connections between anything, if you do many tests or look at many plots or, or, or tables, some of these will be significant. Some of them will always be significant um, if you do enough. Um, and so the more tests you do, the more likely you are to have some po false positives. And if you do enough tests, if you just keep going and going, eventually you'll find a significant result. Um, so, um, and, and that's sort of p-hacking. And so um, it's only when you follow the scientific process that false positives are rare. False positives are very common if you don't follow the scientific process. So by scientific process, I mean, you can use your hypothesis testing to, to come up with an observation and create a hypothesis, but then you have to follow the rest of the process. So you have to collect new data to test your hypothesis on or somebody else can collect new data. For example, your study can be a hypothesis generating study. So you do a bunch of hypothesis tests and you say, I'm doing a hypothesis generating exploratory study. Here are some possible things for other people to you know, do research on. And then they or you can collect more data to test these hypotheses and to go through the rest of the process. And if that's done, then the false positives are rare. But if you skip the middle parts of the scientific process, then false positives are very, very common. Okay. And so the significant results end up not being true patterns in the population of interest, and that means they're not reproducible. And, and that sort of broadly means that, you know, somebody can't replicate your result with their own data because there is the significant result was just because there was a pattern in your data, but not because there was a pattern in the population. Um, of, of that, that you're looking at. And so it, it's, it's very wasteful of time and resources because people follow up you know, conclusions that didn't actually go anywhere. And in very rare cases, it can be fraudulent if it's intentional, but most of the time it is not intentional. Okay, so advice would be follow the scientific method. Always, always, always. You should never use the same data to generate a hypothesis and test that hypothesis. You should always have a hypothesis or several hypotheses very clearly in mind before you look at the data, even before you plot the data or do anything with the data that reveals patterns in the data. Um, so you need to make sure that that's done. So to do that, you can write down your research questions and analysis methods before collecting the data. Um, and I strongly recommend you pre-register these analysis plans. A lot of, um, for example, clinical trials and things now require you to pre-register analysis plans for exactly these reasons. Um, but even if you're not in a field where things are done, there are plenty of places online where you can um, register your analysis plan ahead of time. If you do use hypothesis testing to generate hypotheses, um, this is a perfectly good practice um, and, you know, generating hypotheses is important for further research, but it's just important that you then clearly report this. So you just say, okay, I, I tested all these hypotheses. Here are all of them. It's exploratory. I wanted to generate hypotheses. Here are some interesting things that I found that might be worth testing in the future. And you should report everything you do in your methods. So methods are often so, so short when I read people's methods um, and um, it obviously isn't everything they did. So, um, you know, what did you plot? What did you test? Well, write down all the tests that you did, all the results. Um, at what point did you notice a pattern? And uh, was it before the study started? Was it, you know, after you plotted the data? Was it, you know, in the post hoc um, section? Those are, that's what should be in your methods. And you should also control for multiple testing um, as, a side, as a side note. Um, I tried to look for um, some, um, some good 
there's lots and lots of references. Um, but I find that um, what I found most um, helpful was to just uh, look up these papers, um, these sort of like foundational papers and these on hacking and p-hacking on uh, Scholar and just do a forward um, citation search with your field, research field. And that might get you um, things that are sort of closer to your field that make it uh, a little bit easier to understand. Um, there's also a very good XKCD comic about it. All right, uh, questions? Um, I think there are some, somebody said Ivan got his, a Nobel Prize for this line of work. Simon wants to know what do I mean by small p-value? Oh, well, I guess it doesn't really matter. So if, if a p-value cutoff is 0.05, I mean 0.05, and then I would expect a false positive rate of 0.05. If it's 0.01 or 0.001, then I would expect a smaller false positive rate. But regardless of the p-value cutoff I use, the false positive rate, if I'm harking or p-hacking, would be much, much higher than what um, I am presenting by using that cutoff. Uh, it's Simon also said that Robert Boyle of Boyle's Law reminded folks to report all experimental results, even those which showed no effect. Do I really think that Harking and p-hacking are not intentional. I think they often are not intentional. I think that um, especially harking is is generally taught. I mean, people are told to look at their data before they analyze their data. And I think that if you look at your data, it's very obvious that then you should look at the ones the, the relationships that sort of pop out when you plot your data and those are the ones that are going to be the most interesting. So I think it is absolutely unintentional that people do this. I don't think they understand, I don't think most people who do these practices, I don't think they understand that that it's incorrect or that, that it's giving them bad um, results. Uh, Anna would like to know at what point does multiple tests become multiple? It becomes multiple at two, Anna. Um, so Yes, multiple testing adjustments should be done when you're doing more than one test. Um, of course, the the um, so your by, by controlling um, the the false positive rate. So you know the the famous p-value cutoff of 0.05. Let's assume we're gonna we're gonna use that. Um, that means that um, if there's no effect in the population, I would expect five percent of the time to get a significant result. And that's why I use that cutoff because I know the false positive rate and I've controlled it at exactly that amount. If you do two tests, that is no longer true. So um, then you should, you know, the, the sort of p-value adjust, the, the Bonferroni adjustment and other adjustments adjust your p-value so that you can claim a particular cutoff. But if you do two tests and you do not control, then you can't claim your that that false positive rate, which is the whole point of controlling for false positives. Um, is there a maximum amount of tests that Bonferroni effect takes into account before it becomes harking? So harking is kind of more philosophically different than bon, than, than multiple testing. Sorry, that's from Vicky. So Vicky, um, what when I I. But to in order to so controlling for multiple testing, if you're following the scientific method, so you have some observations, maybe you want to collect data to test seven hypotheses. So you know that this data is going to be quite rich. You don't want to just you know use do one hypothesis. You have seven different hypotheses that you want to test in this data. You collect some data after you've specified the hypothesis. So you're following the the, the experimental design all the way, but you still have seven hypotheses. And that means that your false positive rate is still going to be higher than you than you specify by using a cutoff of 0.05. And so um, you're not harking in that case. You are just um, following the scientific method, but with multiple hypotheses. And that's when you should control for multiple testing. Um, controlling for multiple testing when you're doing um, 
you know, hypothesis generation, I, pro I generally don't. If I'm explicitly doing exploratory work where I'm doing hypothesis generation, uh, unless there's just a huge number of hypotheses, I would just not control, but I always report it as hypothesis generation. I'm doing exploratory work. I have not controlled for, I, I write that. I'm doing, I'm doing exploration. I'm not controlled for multiple testing because it is exploratory and we are hypothesis generating and that's it. Uh, Craig. Okay, so uh, in some cases of large observational studies, certain analyses are conducted using split sample approaches, random split with an exploratory and confirmatory stage. Do I have any comments on this? I think this is a great idea. I, um, I don't have any, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a really good idea. I think this is a, um, a totally valid way to do this. It's as long as they're, you know, independently that the two sources are independent. I mean, you still have, you know, say that you're doing exploratory stuff in with one hospital um, database, you still have the, the problem that it's, you know, not, it may not be relevant to all hospitals, it's still going to be from that hospital, but it's certainly a much better way to go um, than to, than to use the same data set to generate. So you won't get the, um, the sort of um, data looking like you know, the, the sort of false positives won't happen. I don't know if any of the other Stat Central people have a comment on this, but I think this is a great idea to, to do that, Craig. Uh, <clears throat> I just have a sip. Okay, Ben, forgive me for my naivete, but would best practice be then if you plan to do four replicate data collections, then use the first two to generate hypotheses if you suspect some may arise and then do the collection of the next two replicate data sets and test the hypotheses. I guess I wonder why you're doing uh, four replicate data collections, Ben. Is there a reason? Hmm, maybe Ben's gone. Um, I don't know. I guess it depends on sample size and things. I'm not sure why you would use two um, data sets to generate hypotheses. Um, there might not be enough data left in the other two data sets to really test the hypotheses um, well. But yes, like um, like um, sort of um, Craig said, yes, yeah, splitting up the data into two in one one exploratory and one confirmatory is a, you know a good way to go. So yeah, using a completely independent data set um, sort of uh, stops you from harking and, and um, p-hacking to some extent, depending on what you do. Um, Mariana, uh, can pooling be considered p-hacking in some cases? What do you mean by pooling? Pooling like pooling models? I'm not sure. Mariana, you're going to have to tell me. Uh, Shantantu says, isn't p-hacking a shortcut to literature review? I've got to say, I don't understand that. If anyone understands, let me know. So uh, Nishat says, is it okay to generate a hypothesis from previous data? Uh, e.g. results from a study that people did in the past. Yes, that would, that would be a great way to generate a hypothesis. Um, but you cannot generate a new hypothesis from your current data that was used to test a different hypothesis. You can, um, as long as you report it as such. So say you wanted to test um, A versus B and you collected some data, but you also had this variable C and um, you, you tested your hypothesis that you were interested in, and then you did some exploratory data analysis and you found that, well, maybe A and C are also related and that's um, very interesting. Then um, you would say, well, we collect the data to test A versus B, we found that you know, there's a relationship and then explore, you know, we did some exploratory analysis and we found this, and then now we're gonna collect more data to test this other hypothesis that we just generated. So that's fine as long as you don't use the same data set for generating a particular hypothesis and testing that same hy particular hypothesis. I will make the um, seminar PDFs available, yes. 
Okay, so Daniel asks a good question. Even if you were following the scientific method and decided a priori that you wanted to compare the means of two groups, it's common to form other tests, e.g. normality, equal variance, et cetera. Would you consider this multiple testing? What would you advise in these scenarios? Generally speaking, um, uh, it's kind of multiple testing. Um, I, I wouldn't, so um, I guess my first comment is that I don't use hypothesis tests to test normality, equal variance, et cetera. These things are much better tested by looking at a residual plot. And so um, that that sort of, sort of solves part of the problem. Um, but um, yeah, would I, would I control for multiple testing? It, it's, a, it's a gray area. It's not the biggest problem. So I think it's probably okay. Um, it, it's a much smaller problem than the larger problem that sort of I was talking about here, but there are things that are sort of called uh, investigator degrees of freedom and whatnot that um, people do worry about in that context, Daniel. Uh, Joe wants to know, how would you keep multivariate analysis from becoming harking? Oh, very easily. Um, so, um, you have a multivariate data set. Who was Joe? Um, so you might have a multivariate hype, um, analysis. So uh, in this case, you uh, do you mean multivariate or multivariable? So do you have multiple responses, Joe? Is Joe here? Perhaps not. For multivariate analysis, I assume that you have multiple responses. I would usually, if the question requires that you, um, if the question, the scientific question is multivariate. So for example, you have um, seven questions from a survey that are sort of getting at a similar theme. You might wanna know if this, um, this theme of depression, for example, is related to age. So then you can do a multivariate test to see if there are if the, any of them or if, if the whole multivariate um, depression questions are related to age, and then you can drill down if they are, you can drill down into the individual ones and control for multiple testing at that point um, when you're drilling down into the individual questions. Um, there are bits and pieces. Uh, if one wanted to look at effects of A, B, C, and D on X, one can hypothesize that A, B, C, and D have an effect on X. One collects the data and then starts looking at relationships. Would this be testing the hypothesis or would it be considered exploratory testing? You had the hypothesis before you collected the data, so it's testing the hypothesis. So um, you, that, I think that's great. Um, so it's not, not a harking situation um, or a p-hacking situation. The things you need to do is um, multiple testing adjustments and also um, report all the analyses. So if A and B were, um, were, you know, had significant results, but C and D didn't, you still have to report all the results from A, B, C and D, because those were the hypotheses that you had going into the study. And that, that was for, I'm not sure who that is, because I can't read the name, A something. How do you decide? How do you decide on the number of tests or repetitions you need to do to avoid p-hacking? So p-hacking has nothing to do with sample size. Um, p-hacking only has to do with not knowing what your hypotheses are ahead of time. So you need to have the hypotheses that you want to test in a data set set down on, you know, like in 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 in, in I don't know what is like in stone before you collect the data. If you have your hypotheses in stone before you collect the data, then you're not p-hacking. And so then you just test those hypotheses and you're good to go. Okay, so Craig thinks that Shantu is getting at a point that statistical p-hacking might be used because the researcher hasn't done the work of going to the literature and generating a literature and theory derived hypothesis prior to the analysis. I, that's entirely possible, I suppose. Yes. Um, 
So Simon wants uh, says, beware of using published data to generate a hypothesis. There is substantial publication bias. Suggesting is significant data gets published preferentially, often a large effect. That's a good point, Simon. I still think it's much better than using your own data, but yes. Um, uh, what are the consequences of p-hacking? Uh, huge amounts of false positives. So you will end up publishing lots of results uh, that are not true. Basically, uh, if, you, if, if there is absolutely no relationship between anything in your data set, if you do enough statistical tests by um, comparing lots of different things or looking at subgroups or deleting outliers, if you keep doing that, you will eventually find a significant result and it will have no bearing on the real world. It will just be a, a something in the data, but it will not reflect at all what's happening in the population. And so you'll end up having, you know, just publishing false positives. That's Naveen. Okay, I've gotten to the end. Uh, feel free to let us know if you have more questions. Otherwise, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, uh, thank you, Gardana, um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, the recording of uh, the seminar will be available online shortly, later today. Um, and uh, there will be one last seminar for the year um, next month.